Hey, Wave family. Today we are in Galatians chapter 5. Welcome to this chapter overview. Praying you're having an incredible day so far. Whenever you're listening to this, whether it's first thing in the morning, right after lunch, or right before you go to sleep, just praying that you're having an incredible week. We love you. Pastor Marco, all of us on staff, we're with you. We love you. We thank you for being a part of our family. We hope that you feel that love and that encouragement from all of us. We are a family. We are the body of Christ. We hope you're feeling the support and knowing that above all else, above any man or woman, the Holy Spirit is the greatest comforter. And if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's living on the inside of you. So let's do what we always do. Let's pray because we got to invite the Holy Spirit, the teacher of the Bible, to come and teach us what his word is saying. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord. Come right now as we open your words. These are not words that we wrote. These are words, God, that you have written, you have inspired. God, these are your words. Holy Spirit, teach us these principles. Teach us what you want us to know out of this beautiful chapter today. Thank you for this letter. Thank you, God, for everything that you're going to say. And thank you for this moment that we agree with your words and we will believe what you say in Jesus' name, amen. The importance we remember of inviting the Holy Ghost is that this is the textbook of life. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of his book. If the teacher doesn't show up to the classroom, it's hard to be able to pass the tests and the quizzes. But the Holy Spirit being the teacher, and you might ask, why do we have to invite him every single time? He's with me all day long. Yeah, but the nature of the Holy Spirit is he is a gentleman. He's gentle. He never forces himself in on your life. If you invited him yesterday to your life and you were sensitive to him and speaking to him, you got to do it again today. You got to invite him again today. Yes, he's with you. Yes, he cares for you but you need to invite him. You need to tangibly and intentionally invite the Holy Spirit to teach you, to speak to you. He loves to be invited. He loves it. It's like having a home. When somebody comes over to your house, it feels better if they were invited to come. They just show up and then you're like, oh, you're here, Let's, uh, I guess we'll give you some dinner. I guess we'll just bring you in because you're here, okay? Or if you invited them, they know they were welcome. They know that you're expecting them. They know that there's something prepared for them. They come in and you have dinner that you prepared for them and they were invited. It makes them feel something. Well, the Holy Spirit loves to be invited, but not only to the house. Imagine him, he comes into the house and you sit him on the couch and you give him a cup of tea. Here's your cup of tea. So the Holy Spirit takes it. But he won't take anything else until you offer it to him. That's the way he is. He doesn't just assume, well, is the bedroom upstairs to the right, my bedroom? Because I brought my suitcases. I'm planning on staying for a while. No, he'll sit there on the couch, drink the cup of tea that you offered him. If you offer him some food, oh, he'll gladly take it. He won't go into the kitchen and barge in the refrigerator and say, well, you should treat me like family. I am the boss of this house after all. This is my temple. He waits for you to give it to him. He waits for you to offer it to him. If you want to offer him a bedroom, he'll take the bedroom. But do you know his real desire? He wants the whole house. He wants rights to everything in the house. So let's give him that. Our bodies are his temples. Our minds today are focused on him. And as we come to his word, we come into fellowship, into contact with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, which means that we're reading and learning about Jesus every time we open the Bible. For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And that Word, John 1.14, became flesh and dwelt among us. We're knowing about Jesus. We're learning His character. We're seeing His face out of every scripture that we read. So, Galatians chapter 5, remember how we do this. The Bible was not written in chapter and verse. It was written in thoughts and whole letters. So we're going to start by reading the first, last couple verses from Galatians 4 and then flow into Galatians 5. We'll go about this pretty quickly. Um, just because it's an overview. Remember, we want you guys to get revelations from this. So I'll just have a few highlights. Verse 30 from chapter 4 is where we'll start. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, 
but of the free woman. That's where we ended. Now let's continue in that freedom in chapter five, verse one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You guys know that scripture, whom the sun sets free is what? Free indeed. There's a lot of frees there, right? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Why did he set us free? So we could enjoy freedom. Why? Because freedom comes with a lot of powerful things. Freedom to serve God. Freedom from the enemy. Freedom from temptations that have overwhelmed you. You might still be tempted, but you'll have power over those. Freedom over uh, bitterness. Freedom over unforgiveness. Freedom over things that are holding you back. Freedom from false beliefs. Freedom from, from thoughts that keep you down and minimize you in your life and don't allow you to extend to the things you know that God's put inside of you. Freedom from boundaries that people have put on you that God never did. Remember, if people try to put you in a box, it doesn't mean God did. Don't allow other people's words to minimize you and put you into a box that God never said you fit in. The only place that God said you fit was in the royal family with the father and the son and all of his inheritance. That's the place you fit. So if it's anything other than that, you're minimizing yourself. Don't allow people to do it. Don't allow anybody. God sets us free. Jesus did what he did on the cross so that we could be totally free and enjoy what freedom gives us, all that freedom gives us. Stand firm then, verse one, and do not let yourselves be burdened again to the yoke of slavery. Do you know it's possible to be re-burdened or to go back into slavery? Do you know that you could be set free by Jesus from something and be completely bound again? Do you know that Jesus doesn't force us to stay free? Think about that. He loves setting people free, but he won't make you stay free. Think about it like this. You cry out to the Lord. Psalm 34, 4 is a, is a great example. I cried unto the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me of all of my fears. So you cry out to God. You come into a place of desperation in your life. And this happens in many areas, whether it's fears, whether it's uh, relationships, you just come to the end of yourself, right? You say, God, I can't do this anymore. I need your help. This is not allowed. God, I just, I just won't settle for this. God, if you don't show up, I need you, Lord, right now. And what does God do? He's faithful. He shows up. He delivers you. He sets you free, okay? Well, now whose job is it for you to stay free? Jesus sets you free. You never could have done it yourself. But now Jesus has given us his word and his promises that will keep us free. You see, Jesus sets you free. It's something you could never do. Some of you came over out of addictions. There's no way you could have ever been set free from that unless Jesus helped you. Some of y'all hated yourselves, wanted to die maybe, didn't even want to live life. But the son, the radiant, beautiful son, Jesus came in and delivered you. He set you free. But now he gives us his word, and now it's up to us to continue to stay free and walk in freedom. But guess what? He's not leaving us alone. He's not like saying, okay, you're all by yourself now. I did my part. What he's doing is he's partnering with us now, and he's saying, with my word, the words I've given you is a way that you partner with me. You got to believe these. You got to keep them in the front of your mind. You got to stay consistent. That's why the daily growth book is everything. That's why the word of God every day, it's going to help you stay free from the things that you are freed from. Amen. And it also helps you gain ground for new things, for new freedoms. Hallelujah. That's why life's exciting because there's even new freedoms to gain, new things that we're constantly growing in. It's beautiful. So don't be bound again. In other words, he's saying, don't allow yourself to be tricked. Don't allow yourself to be bound by this. Mark my words, verse two, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. So the thing he's saying, don't be bound again is, the thing about circumcision. He's saying circumcision used to be everything, but now with Jesus, it's all about faith and the circumcision of the heart, not the outer man, but the circumcision of the heart. What is that? Confessing, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as Lord, being completely saved by his grace, by faith, through faith. Amen? So he's saying, don't get back to these lawful things. If you're not circumcised, you don't even know me. Don't, don't let people drag you back into those old things. This is a really powerful principle. When you've been set free, it doesn't mean that you don't have responsibilities. It doesn't mean that you don't live in the fear of God. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean that you're not still seeking God to be better, that the Holy Spirit's helping you. He's renewing you daily. What it means, though, is don't go back to these other things and say, that's why I'm saved. 
because of this, because of what I can do. No, you're not saved because of what you can do. You're only saved by, through faith, by grace. Say it to yourself, through faith, by grace. Through faith, by grace. That's why you're saved. Through faith, in what? The sacrifice Jesus paid, nothing that you could have done. So he's trying to tell these people, don't be pulled back by anything. And it's the same today. Don't let anybody convince you that it's the clothes you wear, the makeup you wear or you don't wear. Um, the How many times that you take communion in the week or you don't take communion. Um, whether you wear pants, you don't wear pants. Um, you read your Bible every day, you read any other book. Uh, you watch TV, you don't watch TV. Don't, none of that makes you saved. Don't fall for these things. Jesus did something you could have never done yourself. You just have to accept that. It's beautiful grace through faith in that sacrifice. Verse three, again, I declare every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. He's like, if you want to go that route and try to go the law again and all these regulations, you got to be perfect. You're going to have to fill every single one of them, fulfill every single one. You're not going to be able to mess up in one. Just so you know, if you're going to go this route, you got to do it perfect. Problem is, everybody who's already going to try this has already sinned once, so they're already disqualified. In other words, you're beating your head up against a wall that's never going to move when you try to live your life of salvation with Jesus by law, by these regulations. The Holy Spirit puts boundaries on your life, and those are the ones you follow. Not the regulations of men that say by these things we'll get closer to God. You know, that's what religion is. Religion is a man's man-made ideas and rules in order to make God closer to them or to earn something from God. That's what religion does. It constantly tries to get new rules and new things or ideas to put them into practice so that when you follow these, it will draw God, it will make you worthy of God. If I'm a really, really good person, I know I'm going to go to heaven because I was so great. I, he was such a good person. Well, did he ask Jesus to be his Lord and Savior? Did he repent of his sins? Did he confess that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead? Well, I mean, he was just such a good person. But the Bible says that Jesus is the only way. Only his sacrifice by grace through faith. Amen? You, are, you who are trying to be justified the, by the law will be alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. In other words, you can't do both. You can't live by the law and by grace. You got to pick one. It's either law or it's either grace. If you go to law... You completely are on the opposite side of grace. Wow. Let's live by grace. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcised has any value. The only thing that counts, the only thing that counts, this is right from the Bible, is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts, say that to yourself, is faith expressing itself through love. That's so beautiful. Love is such a beautiful key. We could go deeper into that, but I want you guys to talk about that in your small groups, in your DGs, when you're doing your own Bible study. Ask the Lord about that. What does that mean, deeper? Faith through love. I believe God's going to highlight things to you. It's going to be beautiful. Verse 7, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? In other words, you were doing great. You had accepted my message. Paul's like, you accepted grace. You accepted this could only be in Jesus. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're starting to trip again. You're starting to, starting to revert back to some old mindsets. Who, who cut in? You were running this well. Like, don't let people disturb the peace that you have now. Don't let people come in and convince you that what you're hearing from God and what you had peace about isn't the Lord, actually isn't right. Don't let this happen. God spoke. Know what happened. Believe in it. Stand firm. Verse 8, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. That persuasion doesn't come from God. If it doesn't come from God, who does it come from? Either people or from the enemy. Verse 9, a little yeast. Yeast uh, um, is uh, symbolic of little ideas work through the whole batch of dough. Little ideas, small false beliefs, false beliefs. Man, those are powerful. Your beliefs are everything. Your beliefs are how you see life. If you believe that I'm a good man, you'll receive from me as a good man. If you believe that I'm a bad man, you won't be able to receive from me because you believe that I'm bad. It doesn't even matter. Listen, it doesn't even matter if it's the truth or not. If it's what you believe, 
It's what is the truth to you. This is so powerful. What you believe is your truth. Now, God has written his truth in the Bible so that we won't have to worry. And he, in other words, he's trying to give us what to believe so that we won't have to stumble on false beliefs. He gives us what to believe. But if you have taken your beliefs of God, beliefs about who he is, beliefs about yourself, or beliefs about other people from your experiences in life, and that has become your Bible, that has become what you believe is because of your experiences. Guys, that's not strong enough. The word of God changes our experiences. We don't take our experiences and make it the Bible. Our experiences are not the Bible we live by. The Bible comes into our life to give us our beliefs and our beliefs begin to change our experiences. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. If we weren't able to change by new beliefs, we would not have been able to be saved. It was a new belief. Think about it. Being recommended, but talking about the cross, the gospel, it's a new system maybe you'd never heard before. Thank God that we have the chance to change our beliefs. Because if you were staying still in the way you believed about yourself and the way you believed about the world and believed about God, you would never have been able to be saved. Aren't you glad we get to have new beliefs? God gives us the highest and the greatest beliefs. Hallelujah. Here we go. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be, whoever this person is, they're going to pay the penalty. In other words, if you lead other people astray from the gospel, you will answer to Jesus for that. Verse 11, brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Ooh, dear God, Paul's not happy with these people. Let's just, one thing that we just heard, the one who is throwing you into confusion does not come, in other words, confusion does not come from God. That's what you need to get from this. Confusion does not come from God. He never operates in confusion. He'll never speak to you in confusion. God speaks through peace. God does not speak through confusion. He speaks through peace. If you're still confused about something, whether it's God's will or not, it's just because you haven't fully heard God yet. I promise you, God, when he speaks to you, will give you peace in the midst of crazy situations that you should be confused in, but you won't be because you have peace because God speaks. And when he speaks, you can have peace. God will not come to you in confusion. That's not the Lord leading you into confusion. He leads you in peace. Verse 13, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Oh, this is so good. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. There are some people that were here in this chapter in the Galatian church and still today in our life, in our time, that when they say, I'm free in Christ, they kind of take it to another level that's unhealthy. They don't just say, I'm free in Christ. Now I'm free to do God's will. Now I'm free to bless people. Now I'm free from all of these things that are over me. I'm no longer bound by these addictions. No, they don't just take it there. They say, I'm free now. It's kind of like a person who turns 21. A lot of people, when they turn 21, what are they looking forward to? Freedom. But what do they mean by that? I'm free to drink now. I'm free to go out wherever I want to now. I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to move out the house. I'm going to do whatever, whatever it might be. When you turn 21, people are saying it's freedom, but a lot of the things they're thinking of freedom are not good for them. A lot of the things they're going to take hold of now from freedom is things that are actually going to bind them and make them bound. Jesus is saying, don't use your freedom to indulge in the things that will make you bound again. <laughs> I want you to be free. Remember verse one of chapter five, for freedom's sake, be free to truly be free, be free in Jesus, be free in God, be free in power, be free in health. I don't want you to be free so that you could think you can take this and then get yourself bound again. The entire law is summed up in a single commandment. Verse 14, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. If we are busy devouring and biting each other, man, I could talk on this for a whole hour. Watch out. You're going to be destroyed by each other. Y'all, we live in a society if you look at the top Christian YouTube channels, eight of the top 10 
are built on devouring other believers. Speaking bad about other preachers or pastors or people wanting to correct the whole body of Christ. Can I just ask you guys just and plead with you all? What about the gospel of restoration? What about being the healers? What about Jesus anointing you not to be a wolf or a devourer, but anointing you to be a healer? People fall. Maybe you've fallen before. Weren't you glad that somebody came and helped you up? I know I was. Where have you been before? Aren't you glad that God sent somebody to help you in the midst of your pain and your struggle? Maybe you were in a situation that was hopeless, and if you would have stayed by yourself, you wouldn't have made it. But the Lord sent someone because he loves you, and they came, and what did they do? They patched you up like the Good Samaritan. They healed and poured oil and wine into the wounds. And they brought you back into a place where you could be restored in freedom. That's the Jesus that we serve. Let's not spend time destroying each other, biting each other. Let's go around. Let's heal some people. Let's spend some time inviting each other into healing and walking with Jesus. Verse 16, last few verses, and these are packed right here, but I'll go through them quickly. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Another way of saying that is if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the flesh. Think about that. He's given you the answer. In other words, instead of just stopping something, you need to be doing something. Instead of just saying, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, this is what's important. Remember, just by saying, I won't do that anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. It's not enough. You got to fill the empty space with something that God told you to do. You take over bad habits with better habits. Let me say that again. The only way to get rid of bad habits is to replace it with a better habit. You can't get rid of bad habits by yelling at bad habits, by getting upset at yourself by bad habits. You actually need a strategy of a better habit, a God-given habit, a godly habit that will replace a bad habit. Walk in the Spirit. Do the right thing, and it leaves less time to do the wrong thing. Get about being intentional with the Word of God. Know what you're going to come into the day for. Know that you're going to pray right now. Be intentional about your life. Be purposeful about what you're doing. And it doesn't leave the downtime for the enemy to be able to fill you with the temptations. Don't you know that boredom is Satan's playground? Don't you know that? Boredom is the enemy's playground. It's at the times that we're bored and we feel purposeless that the enemy gets footholds. But if we're full of purpose and we're intentional about our lives, we know what we're doing this morning. We know what we're about to go do this afternoon. We know what we're about to do tonight. We know what we're about in our life. We're waking up with purpose. We're, we're going in. Then the enemy doesn't have chances to get footholds because we're about something. We're walking in the spirit. And we don't have time to gratify the desires of the flesh. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. The spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict one with each other so that you do not have to be able to do what you want. Just so you know, the spirit never wants to do what the flesh wants to do. And the flesh never wants to do what the spirit wants to do. It's never going to change. The flesh will never want to pray. The flesh will never want to fast. The flesh will never want to worship God and praise Him. The flesh is never going to want to talk good about people. The flesh is never going to want to be disciplined and get up and do something and work out. And Discipline is not what the flesh wants. The Spirit never wants to backbite on people. The Spirit never wants to give in to bitterness. The Spirit never wants to, um, uh, uh, to gossip or speak about anybody. The Spirit wants to worship God. The Spirit wants to pray. The Spirit, remember, the Spirit is willing. Jesus said it, but the flesh is weak. They fell asleep in the garden when they should have been praying. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit loves it. The flesh hates it. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Hallelujah. Being led by the Holy Ghost. Talk about that in your groups. Verse 19, the acts of the sinful nature or the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. Let's go for it. Impurities, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Have you ever had any of these? Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, 
factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all the like. Man, you thought that they said enough right there. But he's like, there's a lot more. I'm just saying you're a few of them. The flesh. Now, if you have seen these before, don't keep calling these demons. It says the acts of the flesh. These are the flesh. Now, do demons connect to parts of the flesh? Absolutely. If, if you get in a habit of doing these things of the flesh, then yes, demons have a right to then be able to come in and begin to influence these areas for sure. But just note, these are selfish ambition, selfishness of the flesh. I'm not going to cast out selfishness. I can't lay hands on you and cast out selfishness. You have to crucify your flesh and serve. A lot of people call things that are the flesh demons. And a lot of things that are demons, just the flesh. Anyway, I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this, who live like this, notice it doesn't say those who have done this, not those who have lied one time, those who created sexual immorality and then repented, those who've had a fit of rage and repented, he didn't say that. He said those who live, those who have accepted this lifestyle as a lifestyle that is okay, and they live that way unrepentant, will not go to heaven. Who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These people will not go to heaven. Unrepentant people do not go to heaven. It's people who realize their sin and say, God, I can't help myself. It's through faith, by grace. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That word in step means let us see the rhythm of the Holy Ghost. Let us not become conceited, provoking each other to envy. So as we pray and we close today, are you in the rhythm of the Holy Ghost? Are you in step with the Spirit of God? You know it's easy to get back in step with Him. It's called repentance. Whatever it is you're going through today, I just want to encourage you with this word. Jesus has set you free for freedom's sake. Don't go back to being bound. Don't let people box you in again. Don't be drawn back into anything that you came out of. You're free. You're free. Let's stay free. And you know what? Let's get in the rhythm of the Holy Ghost. It's an exciting life when you wake up and there's already a beat, a rhythm in the spirit, and you get in step with it. It's an exciting life. You know why? Because when you're on the Holy Ghost timeline, where you're on God's timeline and not your own schedule, exciting things are always happening. You might just think you're going normal places, but when you go to the grocery store, something exciting might happen. When you go to the restaurant, you thought you were just wanting to go eat some good food, but something exciting might be there for you. A life is exciting when you're in the rhythm of the Holy Ghost. I pray for every single one of you today. Have an incredible time with this chapter. Get those revelations from God. Write them down. Continue to be faithful with the growth book and with your DGs. And just know we love you. Thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. 